Remember that they're changing my voice. So you see, I've been proving my argument a million times over when other people won't even make it in the first place. Some people might say, hey, why do you keep going on and on? Well, why does someone who's been teaching for 40 years, right, teaching about the Bible, why are they zoomed in on maybe 80 pages, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels of Christ? Why are those like their main, you know, talking points? And then you see that they do a lot of prayer and singing. Okay, a lot of people aren't getting on their bumper. So why would they say, hey, you know, why do you keep going over the things that matter most in the Bible? The greatest commandment, the golden rule, the thing that people, the things that people need to hear the most, you know, because there's no point in being a Christian if you're not going to obey God through me. So you need to understand these very key points that have to do with the difference between me and other people. He's a bunch of communist Christians, quote unquote Christians, don't want to admit that, right? You know, socialists, left wing, what have you. Socialists in the sense of mainstream social politics, not in the sense of wanting social security or welfare or other social programs is a story for another day. A lot of white supremacists, Jewish supremacists, LGBT supremacists, other racial supremacists, they don't want people to think a certain way because they don't live the way, the truth, and the life. I do. So when we look at this thing, right, what is, what is it saying about wisdom? It says wisdom is beneficial, right? Like a good, like a moral inheritance. Now they say, well, you know, why don't you translate it like the New Living Translation where they translate inheritance as money? Because in Matthew 6, it says store riches in heaven. And it goes without saying that righteousness is greater than wealth. I mean, we look at the dating culture of a so-called Christian society. You see women like, now I don't want to insult anybody here, but they're whoring themselves in the next week. And that's why when we see the first trumpet and the first bowl, that sores break out on the people. And the word sores is like the word whores. Have you ever heard the expression rhyme and reason? Quite often, when I look at wordplay, when I look at words, etymology, linguistics, the lexicon, the wordplay, the gospel, the go, spell, spelling, a magic spell, if you will, I see that rhyme and reason comes into play. Hate, rate, fate, late, gate, okay? You know, win and sin. Okay, light and might and right and sight. They, 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 these words seem to have a certain profound connection or at least an informative connection. And if for nothing else, they help you think about how ideas connect and relate and so on and so forth. So when I see the word sores, rhymes with the word whores, and I see these people have given up God and God is love and that righteousness, that true love which is derived from righteousness and justice and wisdom, is no longer there, then they're just whoring themselves literally and otherwise. And the sores, and sometimes, you know, some of these STDs are sores, but it's more than that. It's just one of many applications of the punishment. Okay, and we see the word eros, which is their Western deities of love, right? You know, Cupid is stupid, right? Stupid Cupid, eros, erotic desire, pagan desire, pagan fake love, right? The fake conceptions of love that come from Greece. Okay, and I know because I was engaged to a Greek woman, <laughs> a little comic relief there, but, you know, they have to do with, you know, agape and, and pragma and storage, these kind of versions of love. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about. They do it within the boundaries of Zeus's raping little kids and raping all these people. Look up, look it up in Greco-Roman mythology. There's a bunch of child molestation and rape in there. And Zeus's most pronounced characteristic is rape. You know, he's king rape. And through terror and rape and storms and confusion and just falsehood, he rules over the Greco-Roman deities, which represent the demons of the underworld, which is why one of the translations of Job, where it talks about the wisdom and the, and the hawk, okay, spreading its wings to the south, is when winter is approaching, not just in Canaan or Israel, okay, but also in Egypt, right? They're right next to each other. Okay, the idea that is being said there in the Amplified Version, is just like Europe is colder um, than Africa, right? It, it reaches, you know, there's snow and it gets colder than Africa does. So it is that winter, when it's approaching, okay, it, it seems to have a connection. Must be the breeze or something to that effect, right? I don't have this down to exact science, but when it gets colder, that the, the hawks migrate to the south. Why? Because it's warmer, right? The sun, right, is hot, okay? So when they migrated as cults and they were expelled as cults, right? When they were expelled and some migrated and some people left on their own and they said that they wanted to be where the evil people are, they went to the southern uh, uh, Mediterranean basin, you know, southern Europe, and some of them went beyond that all the way into northern Europe. Now, I'm not saying that white people are inherently evil, but I am saying that many of their ancestors um, migrated there 
okay, uh, because they wanted to be parts of evil cults. Okay, for example, if you saw those martial art, African martial art cults south of Egypt and in southern Egypt, and you saw that there's Zeus and Hera and Baal in the Middle East and, and in southern Europe, right? Okay, you would kind of go where you want to go, right? Like if you live in America, you know, and you want to move, you move to where you think you should. And they were moving to the rape cult centers, okay? And eventually the Colosseum would be there and so on and so forth. So if you wanted to be a cruel and petty and materialistic person, where would you go? I'll let you answer the question. I'm not racist. I mean, part white. I'm not racist. If I was all white, I'd say it the same way, okay? This is the truth. Part of what it means to be a man is to admit these things, okay? Now, I am saying that people, all people of all races, when they're outside the divine order, are evil. If you don't obey God through me, you are evil. Okay, whether you know it or not. You reap what you sow. God cannot be mocked. He punishes people for generations. The number three is symbolic. Okay? We see the numbers three and four and five and seven. You see it with the bread. You see it with, you know, various things in the temple and so on and so forth. Okay? And, and you know, the number of days in creation and, and so on and so forth. Twelve disciples, twelve gates. You see these numbers are connected so much in the Bible that, wait for it, there's a book in the Bible called Numbers. Yes, there's a book in the Bible called Numbers, and there's another book called Judges, because they want you to use good judgment and do what is right. And, and, and they want you to use the proper measure, which is righteousness and justice. what Proverbs 20, excuse me, not Proverbs, uh, Isaiah 28, 17 is saying. So when it comes to having wisdom, right, is it saying that the scribe calculate the number? No. In Revelation, that's not what it's saying. When it says to understand the mark of the beast, it's like understanding good and evil in general. That's what it's saying. To understand good and evil in general and the divine order and the importance of it and to have the wisdom to lead, you have to see the sun. That's what Ecclesiastes is saying. That's why it has a fancy name, Ecclesiastes, to help you understand that in order, you have to be in the divine martial art order, right? The hawk and the wisdom, the sun and the wisdom, those who have wisdom, okay, those who, you know, the only way to benefit from wisdom is to see the sun. And what is the sun? In Psalm 19, it's the symbol of the bridegroom. And the bridegroom is a champion who's rejoicing to run his course. And what is the, the champion, right? Well, Goliath's called a champion in Isaiah 42, uh, 13. It says, God marches out like a mighty warrior, like a champion. He raises his battle cry and so on and so forth. A champion, right? It's a martial art champion. We see it in Psalm 18, where God trains the king's hands for battle, right? So they're not talking about a volleyball or a pie-eating contest. And notice they made it harder for me to speak earlier. And so it's been some time, aired out the car a little bit. Um, there's not so much fumes in the air right now, but there's still the long-term cognitive impairment. And I'm sure you can see that you're far better off joining me in suffering for God to some degree than suffering for the devil and having extreme regrets in the most important time in history. No one with balls and a dick that is that are working, okay, is going to choose to be a punk at this point. Nobody who has it in their genes to have a working pair of balls and a working heart and brain is going to choose to be a punk. They wouldn't be capable of choosing to rebel against me, especially when it means that you're in bed with pedos. Obviously, when they made the decision to persecute me, they made the decision to make their genes and their offspring and their spirits and their souls the most detestable to God. And they serve as an example. When you see the rich, when you see people who are the types of people who would give this order, who have the power, people in the military, the government, the governing class, the corporations, the masons, when you see them, you just know. Those people are hell-bound people who are among the most cursed in history and somewhere, somehow, among them, among their tree, among people like them, people like them are the most cursed people in history, the most cursed people ever possible, and their offspring are marked for extreme punishment. And they made that decision as groups, without a speck of heart among them, to persecute the most righteous person ever. So some, you know, some racist people might say because they're white or because they're Jewish. Some people who don't like LGBT people might say, hey, it's because they're LGBT people. None of that stuff, no matter how you slice it, is an excuse okay they fucked up in a way that's irreversible because what they did was a crime against God and it's irreversible no one can change what they started and what they started was the process of 
As I die, as my flesh dies, people are cut off from heaven so they can act like complete propaganda bitches and pretend that their culture, English, Jewish, American, white, LGBT, to pretend that their cultures have some sort of divine importance? How could they? Are they not the cultures that are governed by the people who have betrayed God the most in a way that's irreversible that them and their offspring can never be redeemed from? Is that racism or just obvious truth? Clear cut, obvious, 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 obvious truth. Are they also not the cultures that came together to make some sissy rules in the air? No, he can't say that. We're so manly that we, we got to whine and say he can't say that. Is that not who they are to the essence of their souls? When they're faced with the most important decision in history, what do they choose? Now, am I racist? No, I'm part white. My mother often hears me, you know, thinking out loud and making videos. She used to hear me making videos when I made them in the house all the time. Okay? She knows I'm not racist. If you were a stranger, you'd probably know I'm not racist. But these things need to be said. Okay? When people look at themselves as a race or as a nationality, and they come into those cultures that are ruled by these governing class families that have done generations and generations of the most horrible things ever till they finally, you know, cross the line to the point of no return. Okay, what happens? If you look at Caesar saying, well, I'm white and I'm Caesar, yes. Okay, and you join him and you say, well, I'm white and I'm a Roman and that's my culture. What happens when Rome goes to England, France, Spain, the rest of the world? Okay, and they say, yes, we are now Roman too, okay? And you say, well, I guess I'm a trickle-down Roman as well. What do you think happens? That's why it says in the Bible, it says, come out of Babylon. Babylon is northern kingdom, if you will. That's one way to define Rome. Babylon's kind of northwestern kingdom. Okay, that's Babylon's system. Your white Jewish and LGBT cultures, quote unquote, okay? Because remember, race and culture aren't the same thing. Those cultures are Babylonian. How, how often do you see people are black washed or, or Mexican washed or Filipino washed or Asian washed in America? They're white washed. It says, don't love the world or anything in the world. Narrow is the way to life, broad is the way to destruction. So, what are ev what's everyone doing? They're like, I'm taking on Judeo Christian culture. And they're going straight to hell, even according to their own book. So even according to their own book. Now you tell me, if you were a mulatto person, the top martial artist ever possible, the son of God, and you were at one point engaged to a white female who had a child that was white as well, that you were willing to raise if she didn't leave you and betray you, who even after she did that, you know, I wasn't like mad at white people. I'm still looking for love in every race, including white people. Okay. You tell me if people persecuted you for white, Jewish, and LGBT supremacy with an emphasis on their family's kind of sexual control of the world. You know, to the you know, there's a lot of these people, mind you. But they try to do it based on a kind of existing generational hierarchy, if you will, right? Where they, you know, measure things in terms of their endless genealogies and who makes more money and, and petty stuff like this. And they play some kind of Greco-Roman game that determines who has what status. How would you describe things? Okay, it's already taken like, what, 13, 14 minutes in this video? I had to do it in, in clips because I'm being filmed. How would you describe it? Would you beat around the bush? You say, let me be politically correct. Okay, what the heck? Do I have to be, at what point can I point the finger where it belongs, right? Do I have to be 60% white, 70, 80, 90, 100? Where, where, what point do you finally say, hey, you know, that's not racism, it's just truth. You know, I told them, I said, you know, I'll even make a moral committee where there's people from every race. And whenever I say something that, you know, seems to be too harsh to a race or something, I'll run it by that person. And I'll make videos with that person as much as I can about the same topic. OK, and I'll, I'll tell them right after a while, they get used to the pattern and they'll say, yes, say whatever you feel. And they'll explain it from their point of view and their words, why it's OK to say, it. you know, but let's face it. They're firing at me in a certain way that is on behalf of their races and their races are following their orders. They might not be a big fan of it at times, 
but they're following their orders. So in the name of white supremacy, they're defying God. It's like uh, Goliath, right, where he said that he defies the God of Israel. So here, here they're saying that they defy the God of the Royal African Falcon Martial Order, which is the one true God, right? My religion is moral precision. It's not being black. It's not being from Egypt, per se, or Nigeria, or America, or California. My religion is moral precision, even if I lived on the moon, even if I turned white, okay? It's always going to be moral precision. So the God of moral precision, what is right and righteousness, is God. So they said that they defy God in the name of the white race, in the name of the Jewish race, in the name of the LGBT community worldwide. And they defy God in the name of token minorities and thugs and no higher cause and on and on and on. How would you then respond? If in the story of the Philistines and the Jebusites and the Amorites, you know, joined Goliath, would David not, not be right to say, why did you Philistines do that and start cursing them out? And you, Capernaum, okay, will you be lifted to the heavens? And you, Philistines, and you, Amorites, and you, Jebusites. What would the righteous man do? What would I, Jesus, do? Would you not be disappointed if I didn't call them out? Would you prefer I'm politically correct? Would you prefer I bend over backwards and kiss their ass? Perhaps I should put on a MAGA hat. Or get a Joe Biden bumper sticker? Would you prefer that, you know, I start dancing to their new age tune? It says in Revelation 19, he'll wage war with a double-edged sword, a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. The sharp sword of scripture, the sword of the spirit, the sword of God. Heaven's sword. They stepped up to the plate and said, fuck you, man. And they said, you know, and they cursed God like in Revelation. They cursed God. They kept refer, uh, worshiping demons. They refused to uh, repent. They kept being evil. So, yes, I told them. I told them just like that. Who among you would say that I'm wrong? Make your case. By goodness, make your case. 